<laughs> didn't at all mind the idea of attending rehearsals solo. He even had a notion that Miss Stanley might put himself forward for one of the lead roles. He was an untutored but decent baritone, certainly good enough to take on Baron Sita. Why not? Silently, his head nodding in time, he began to hum. In curious contrast, the man next to him, George Colaby, was silently praying. His prematurely balding head bowed low, a deeply religious man and a traveller for Matterson's Meats, selling their pork and bacon products to retailers all over Munster. Although only 28 and his wife 26, this would be their fourth child. <laughs> Having been graced with three girls, he hoped that God would understand why he had been praying for a boy child since arriving to St. Gerard's several hours before. Oh, Jesus, the Lord of mercy, do I have a poor sinner and have no right to ask favours of you today? So <laughs> <laughs> Compassion and love, you will listen to my plea and grant my invitation. I doubt for the safeguard of my child that I am closed at this occasion. You will grant me the miracle of a healthy bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blessed Mary, Mother of God, and just see it. <laughs> and beg the indulgence of your most wise, merciful, and loving son to allow me the opportunity to raise a strong and upright Catholic boy who I will teach to be your humble sober dog the days of my life. George Colopy's lips didn't move as on and on the words tumbled through his head. Sometimes he drifted onto decades of the rosary, keeping count to the Hail Marys by moving his right thumb from finger to finger. <laughs> and after five joyful mysteries in the Hail Holy Queen, reverting again to another variation of his specific <laughs> heartfelt personal plea for his one abiding wish. The man sitting slumped forward between George Colopy and Fancy, the last of this coincidence of fathers to be, desired neither son nor daughter. Michael Liston's black-bowed head seemed to assert his reluctance even to be here. He had last become a father 12 years ago and didn't want to be one again. He didn't even want to be married anymore, not a horror anyway. Mm -hmm. Right now, he just wanted a drink. To have been caught, snared like this, left him brooding and resentful. The one and only time in more than two years, for Jesus' sake, <laughs> a drink he had to concede had played its wretched part, although it in no way prevented Michael from blaming that cow for luring him into some kind of trap. This suspicion had befuddled him for months since. Had she somehow heard about his opportunity of a move to Dublin? How could that be? He hadn't told her anything. The phone call was strictly on the QT from a high up in the Department of Industry and Commerce, a special word in his ear, because Michael's expertise and loyal support were much appreciated. Things were about to change. At last, he was told, Dev was moving on. Economic regeneration could begin. Everything was going to loosen up, especially in the area of rezoning and urban planning. <laughs> Dublin was about to be transformed. That was the precise word the high up used. Transformed. Planning experts like Michael would be in demand. Was he interested in a move? Michael was more than interested, especially if at the same time it allowed him to engineer a gradual withdrawal, an ultimate escape from married life, even though he could never end the marriage itself. Then the fiendish bitch told him she was pregnant for the first time. <laughs> it was a miracle, she declared. It was hard to tell if the smile on her face was true maternal joy, a sign that all was for the best and their love had been renewed and borne fruit despite all their little trials and tribulations or triumphant malice. Michael never hated her so much. With a child on the way, he couldn't leave her, and if they all moved to Dublin together, he'd never ever escape, ever. The only reason he was sitting here at all, staring at the floor, savagely smoking, was because his sister had called to the house earlier, looked him in the eye and said she was sure he must be up the walls, wondering how poor Eva was getting on, and she'd be more than happy to mind the twins while he went to St. Gerard's. How closely women stuck together in these situations. Michael Liston was sure of one thing. Whether this creature turned out to be a boy or girl who would be wanted or loved, not by him. And no one could make him. Not her, not his sister, not anyone. Fancy's thoughts, less fixed and certainly less angry than the man seething quietly next to him, were like the restless Atlantic tide that every August he watched rolling in and crashing on Ballybunion Strand. All kinds of flotsam washed about in his worried head. But the high tide mark was always Anne, and each time his thoughts returned to her, she seemed to roll in that little bit closer. First, he allowed himself a vague reassurance that she must be all right, because if there was any problem, surely someone would come and tell him. He wondered then if he should go home. Was Mary Storen managing all right, looking after his four as well as her own? At nearly twelve, Richie was probably old enough and sensible enough to be of some help to her. He always tried so hard. 
does his best, was the phrase that seemed to appear a lot in school reports. <laughs> Brother Murray said it to Fancy one day at a school, a school sports day. Richie would always be Anne's favourite, though she'd never admit it. Anne, the wave rolled up the strand again, and his uncertain imagination now saw her in a big iron bed in a spotless ward, surrounded by large comforting women with basins of hot water and towels and scissors. At the moment he closed in on her face, twisted in pain, he shifted his thoughts quickly. But the bags of coal left on the lorry outside be all right. Bangston Street wasn't the safest at this hour. Maybe he should go out and have a look. Whatever about stealing the coal, messers could easily jump at the back and start throwing looks at each other. He tried to recall how it had been the last time. Not the last terrible time when the baby was lost, but the time before with Martin. That was at the flat. Fancy had been able to go to bed and sleep. Someone had woken him with the good news. With Marion, before that, he hadn't been there at all. It happened in the middle of the afternoon while he was at work. Maybe things went much faster in a nursing home with everything laid on. He wondered how long these other lads had been sitting there. Had anyone told them what was going on? Anne had taken on sewing work and saved and saved so she could afford to come here. It was all paid for already. She was amazing that way when her mind was made up. All would come to the last time, of course. When he'd mentioned to his mother how upset Anne was, his mother had said he should tell her just to get on with it. Everyone lost baby. She herself lost three of his God's will. Say a Magnificat and pray for intercession on behalf of the poor people's soul in limbo. Fancy did all those things himself, and they helped him, but he never mentioned that even to Anne. It would have gone through the roof, especially as the advice came from his mother. Of course, if it had been his father saying exactly the same thing, Anne would have said how kind Robert was to be thinking of her. Lovely Robert. <laughs> a true gentleman. Fancy knew that as far as his father was concerned, the best decision his son ever made was to marry Anne Casey, a sensible, smiling girl with a lovely, gentle singing voice. Mr. Barry here. It was just two o'clock when a young girl of no more than twenty came into the waiting room, looking around as she spoke. There was a couple of seconds delay, and then, as if only now remembering his name, the youngest of the five men suddenly jumped up. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, that's me, yeah, wait, yeah. <laughs> that good news, yeah. Your mother this made his lovely baby by a while ago. Yeah, yeah, jeez, really, yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> Flicking back his fringe, his pink face flushed even more in embarrassment at his own excitement. Do you want to come up and see them? As the young fella hurried out ahead of the girl, Fancy caught the eye of the man he did not know was Cormac Kiley, who was smiling with the smile of an old hand. One down, he's four strikes, eh? <laughs> yes, yes. Fancy gestured politely as he smiled and spoke, but quickly noticed how visible on his palm were lines of ingrained black that even Swarfiga couldn't shift. He folded his arms again. Fancy wondered how many children did these other men have already? Two of them seemed near his own age in their thirties, and the one who would have spoken to him was definitely older, maybe forty-five or so. Would Fancy be still having children at that age? Not for him to decide. It was going to be hard enough now taking care of five. At least it meant getting near the top of the council list for a three-bedroom house. <laughs> <laughs> that would mean higher rent. Richie was finishing national school next year, so there'd be, no fee. there'd be fees if he went on into secondary. There'd be no week's holiday in Ballybunion this August for the Strongs, and maybe not next year either. He'd better pray for a freezing, wet, fire-lighting winter. Dozing off, he woke to hear the girl telling the older man, who she called Mr. Kiley, that he had had a beautiful new daughter born at 12 minutes after three. He took the news in his cheerful stride, as if this happened every other week. That's four daughters to comfort my old age and three sons to spy us. Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> God bless you and keep you. After he left, the one who was going bald seemed to get more nervous. Fancy didn't like to look, but he could sense him shifting about on the, on the bench and even heard him whispering to himself. The next time the girl put her head round the door, he jumped up like he was electrocuted as soon as she said his name. Mr. Canopy. Yes, yes, that's me. Congratulations. You have a new baby boy. Born at five to four. Mr. Conley couldn't speak. He put his hands to his mouth and breathed in and out. Then he blessed himself, <laughs> raised his head, and prayed aloud. Oh, most loving and tender Jesus. <laughs> you have heard the prayer of an undeserving sinner. I am yours unto eternity. He blessed himself again and made a genuflection in front of the open mouthed girl. <laughs> Can I go see him? No sooner had the girl pulled the door behind him than the man who smoked shook his head. Sweet suffering to find Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> a 
few moments later, he stood up and left. <laughs>